Hello and welcome to Made in Siberia. In this video I'm going to talk about a very fundamental concept that I often see people get confused about, and for a good reason too. What is ground on a circuit board? Can you plant a tree in there? Of course not, and neither does a grown one. To help you understand, I'm going to begin talking about very basics of electronics theory, and then gradually we'll talk about more complex things. I'm going to timestamp this video, so if you're already familiar with some sections, feel free to jump ahead. Imagine a wire suspended in the air where both ends are connected to electromagnetic field generator which is basically a magnet and it rotates clockwise and in this case the current exists in the form of alternating current which flows a little bit forward and a little bit backwards and it's bidirectional. So a typical light bulb will have two connections. One is the hot connection which is a red wire or a brown in the UK and it supplies positively charged electrons to the light bulb and the other wire is called neutral which is usually blue in color and it provides a return path for negatively charged electrons which go basically to ground. For example let's take a look at the electrical installation in this house. This is where the electricity enters the building and you can see live and neutral wires coming in here and getting into the consumer unit which contains MCBs and RCDs for the distribution points of the system and next to it you will see uh, this metal bar which can combines all earthing in the house and mixes them all together and down here you will see the earth electrode which we're gonna talk about in a minute Effectively, the neutral wires combine with the earth at this point and this type of the system is called TNCS and the neutral wire is where the return current for the whole system is coming to. However, the yellow and green wire has a completely different function. Instead of providing a return path, it provides a path for a fault current. You see, sometimes you get lightning strikes that may hit your building, or you can get a short circuit between your hot connection and your metal case. And this is what the yellow-green wire is for. It provides a path to the ground in case of, a, of such fault. So to summarize, the yellow and green wire does not carry current by design and it's only there to provide a fault current in case of a lightning strike or similar. This is a very important distinction because a lot of people get confused about this and they think that the earth wire is carrying current and that they can make a circuit with the earth wire, which they of course shouldn't. And in a typical electrical appliance which is designed to be working everywhere in the world, the earth wire may not be connected in some places. For example, in North America and Europe you don't have this option, you don't have this wire at all. You only have neutral and hot wires. Now we started with a very simple AC system, but let's consider uh, turning it into a DC system. So we add a DC rectifier, which is basically a diode bridge. And uh, now it's going to convert the AC current uh, with a 0.714 ratio uh, to DC. Now this is something you will typically see on a circuit board where you have your AC current supplying the PCB. But then the AC current you get from the main supply is regulated with a switch mode power supply or toroidal transformer and converted to DC with a DC bridge or synchronous rectifier. So in that case the return path must come back to the rectifier fine capacitor. So imagine the capacitor which now has positive and negative terminals and the positive terminal is supplying your circuit and it coming back to the negative terminal and this is now your circuit it, it is effectively a loop and as the positive electrons lose their charge they must come back to the capacitor which set them off originally. Also the frequency of this signal is variable because you can have different DC-DC converters which change their speed according to the design uh, requirements. And this is a very important consideration here because for low frequencies less than 100 kilohertz the return path will typically be a straight line. The current will simply follow back in the path of the lowest resistance. 
However, as the frequency increases uh, and above 100 kHz, the return path is now the path of lowest inductance. And what it typically means is that the return path will follow the path of its trace. So it will concentrate around the trace and below the trace. And this is why for high frequency signals above 100 kHz, the return path must be a solid ground plane which is adjacent to the layer where you have your components. So if we consider adding a typical microcontroller or an ADDA converter after the DC-DC converter which we added to our circuit, then you may see in the datasheet that it will have different ground pins. It may have analog ground, it may have digital ground, it may have power ground. There are a lot of different pins on those ICs and what typically gets people confused is that they don't know what to do with them. And really the answer is you should not separate anything. You should not split grounds. Never split grounds. You should always connect them all to the common return path which is a solid ground plane which is adjacent to this layer. So if you have your high frequency component such a microcontroller on the top layer then the adjacent return layer must be 4 mil down on the inner layer and this is how it should be. It should be completely solid and it should be all around this IC. So uh, the size of the PCB, it should be all filled with ground and I'm sure you've seen that before. And the basic idea is that this plane will provide a low impedance return path to the capacitor which has supplied the DC to this board or if you already have DC coming in, then you will have an input capacitor somewhere on a PCB and the input capacitor will act as a bulk capacitor and this is where the return path must be provided to and it has to be low impedance because of high frequencies involved. So the only exception to this rule may be when you have an analog sensor surrounded by noisy components such as DC or AC motors on an analog amplifier and you really want to provide a separate return path from this sensor to somewhere else on the circuit board where there is less noise. The important thing to remember is that it has to be a low frequency component because if it's not a low frequency component it's simply going to cause a radiated emissions failure during compliance testing. But if it is a low frequency component then what you do is that you provide a star point grounding for all those low frequency return paths and you basically have it somewhere where you have the least amount of noise on the circuit board and you provide all those individual return traces and you treat them exactly like that. You treat them like individual return traces that are coming back to this point. But I'm only saying that as an exemption to the rule and typically you should never split grounds under the AC and you should connect all of those pins, analog, digital, power pins, all to the same ground plane which is going to be completely universal on the circuit board. The only other exception I can think of is when you have isolation requirements then this is no brainer, you just create an isolation bridge which could be a transformer or an optocoupler and anything on the left side of it you trip it as one piece PCB and everything on the right hand side of it you treat it as a separate PCB and you basically never cross anything in between. One final point about electrical ground which is also related to the concept of isolation is that people often assume that the earth has exactly the same potential anywhere you go and that the earth electrode in the building A will have exactly the same potential as the earth electrode in the building B. This is not at all true because earth has different composition and it affects electrical conductivity. So the potential difference between grounds in different buildings can be really high, it can be up to 500 volts. Imagine Bob, a telecommunication engineer wiring an Ethernet cable between building A and building B and in the process he's dragging the cable on the ground and this cable is developing a lot of static energy, a lot of passive current. Then he connects it to building A on one side and to building B on the other side and doing that can create a massive spike because there is a lot of potential difference between the points and you have a lot of static energy in the cable so this can now either kill Bob or damage a lot of equipment. Likewise, when lightning strikes, it can travel inside the building and cause shock to someone just using the equipment. So this is why we have isolation requirements for all building-to-building -building wiring systems. This mostly affects coaxial and ethernet cables and you always have transformers and optocouplers which provide 1.5 kilovolt isolation between each block of the system. 
And on the AC main side, you have exactly the same concept where you have transformers providing 4 kV isolation between each AC element of the system. So I hope this video helps you understand a little bit about ground and how it works in electrical systems, whether they are AC systems or DC systems and where it all coming back and where it comes from and so on. In the next video I'm going to talk about signals radiating in air, which is a very exciting subject and it's a related subject, because when signals cannot find the path of lowest inductance, this is what they tend to do, they start radiating in air, and uh, we're gonna cover it in the next video. I hope you enjoyed it, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next week.